Hey guys, how's it going? Uh, we got like a whole box of body spray for them, so we can. We're wondering how the other guy got on our table. Yeah, let's come to the table. No, I don't know. 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 You missed our group. Photoshop for men. Photoshop for men. Honestly, that's what I was very to do. And you also want to make that as it is. Oh, What's that in your foot? Yeah. You're in and out? Damn, you're in. Oh, yeah. What's that in your feet? Oh, 
Uh, 14. Damn. Damn. Wait, but he's not liking her big at nine and a half. He's tall though. What are you trying to say over here? Sure. Just because he has a mullet, he's just like better than me. Yeah. Big feet proportionally. You're like a hobbit. <laughs> Small <laughs> big feet. All right, it's four o'clock, so let's go and get started today. All right, good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Amazing. Good. It's how good. Tired. It is hot. And what the heck happened? Where'd winter go? <laughs> I feel like we say that every year, but because uh, you know California weather gets more and more unpredictable every year. But uh, yeah. Okay. And so uh, today is our second uh, second day in person, and so it's it's good to see everyone in, in person again. And so uh, the plan for today is we're going to pick up where we left off on on Tuesday. So we we're talking about medical imaging. And so I want to finish up those lecture slides today. Uh, and then I have another set of lecture notes we're going to start on um, basically our first our first um, discussion of biomechanics. Okay? Um, one more thing I want to do today, because next week we're going to be working with the software for the first time. Um, and because it's a research software, I, I'm not able to install it on these computers here. And so uh, you're going to have to run it on your own personal machines. And so uh, one thing I want to show you guys today is, is how to install it. And I'm going to send out those instructions, you know, later on, just so that next week when we start using the software, then you guys will have it ready to go. Because uh, my plan for next week is to have kind of a, a hands-on um, kind of a uh, workshop uh, for the software, just so that we can all can kind of use it together. And if you have, if you run into issues, you can uh, you can just ask me questions in the class. Because it's uh, what I learned last year. So last year when I taught this class, it was completely virtual. Uh, and it was probably one of the most difficult things I, I'd ever experienced because, um, you know, it's running research software, um, everyone on their own computers, you know, all trying to debug issues at the same time. And it was, um, you know, trying to do that over Zoom and that's, that's really, really hard. So I'm hoping that that part, that part of the semester, this, that part of the class goes a little bit smoother this semester, just because, you know, you guys will be in the class here and I can go around and, and actually like point to stuff and on your screen. So, um, and so, um, basically right after we finish up the, uh, um, 
right after we finish up the medical imaging slides, I'm gonna take a break just to show you guys how to install the software. And uh, if you don't have your laptops right now, it's, it's totally fine. You know, I'll, 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 I'll clip it on YouTube and I'll send it to everyone um, just so everyone can, uh, can install it over the weekend. Okay. All right, um, announcement. So I, I posted your next homework. So your homework two is, uh, is posted. And so most of the homework is, is, is actually gonna be conceptual questions. Um, so it's a lot of what we're, we're doing in terms of like medical imaging and in arterial biomechanics, which is the next set of lecture notes. It's mostly conceptual, um, conceptual stuff. Uh, it builds off of our engineering knowledge, but you know, because it, it's mostly biology, it's, it's kind of necessarily a conceptual in nature. So there's quite a few conceptual problems on that homework. Um, and I believe that's going to be due two weeks from Monday. And so there's, uh, there's quite, there's quite a bit of time on that. Um, I, 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 the reason I kind of pushed the deadline back for that homework was to kind of give you guys some time to work with the software, because basically starting next week, the, the, the project for this class is going to start. And so the, the, the uh, starting next week, you know, we're going to be working on that project throughout the whole semester. And so I wanted to give you guys some time to kind of, you know, get familiar with the software, get some questions answered, um, and really kind of, kind of get a good start on that project, because it's, it's, it's going to be a long process throughout the, the whole semester. All right, and so uh, with that, are there are there any other questions I can answer before we get started today? Okay, all right, so let me go ahead and swap to this um, screen here for you Zoom people. Okay. Right, and so we're gonna pick up where we left off in terms of medical imaging, okay? And so just to kind of recap from Tuesday, you know, we, we started talking about this idea of uh, medical imaging which is uh, basically whenever you go to the doctor and they need to look at something inside your body, uh, they, need to take, they need to take some kind of imaging, okay? And so the idea is to use um, medical uh, diagnostic equipment to obtain um, visual information, mostly visual, uh, of, a, of, of the uh, anatomy inside a patient, okay? Uh, and so we went over the types of imaging, and I think this is where we kind of left off, where we were talking about kind of the main, uh, the main categories of images, right? Uh, so we went over simple x-rays, you know, which, which I think everyone's probably experienced at some point in their life. Uh, we talked about CT scanners, uh, where again, CT scanners are basically just x-rays just taken, you know, rotating around, that rotate around you really, really quickly. So they can create a 3D, a 3D, um, 3D data set, okay? And for your project, you know, you'll, you'll mostly be working with CTs. I, I, I don't think there are any MRI data in, in the data set that I have, but I but I, I could be wrong. But I know the vast majority of them are, are CT for sure. Okay. Uh, and this is exactly where we left off. And so we were talking about MRIs, uh, and I was kind of gushing about MRIs last time, if you remember, um, because it's a it's it's a it's a crazy it's a crazy phenomenon, right? So practically speaking, you know, MRIs the the main benefit that they have over the other imaging types is that they're really good at at, at imaging soft tissue. Okay. And when I talk about soft tissue, I mean things like um, things like your muscles, things like your ligaments, things like um, you know basically everything in the body that's not bone. You know, MRI is, is very good at, at imaging. Okay, and the way it does this is very different than um, an X-rays or CTs, um, because the way X-rays and CTs work, if you remember, you know they rely on radiation, right? And so they pass some radiation through your body, and because radiation doesn't pass through bones that well, um, that's how you can get those those really nice X-ray images. Okay. The way MRI works is actually by controlling the spin and controlling the magnetism of the individual atoms inside your body. So that's why I was kind of saying it's kind of a crazy thing. Um, and so, you know, we can, we can go on for a few lectures about how MRIs work, but, you know, the basic idea is that, you know, any atoms that exist out there uh, in, in the world, it's not just in your human body, any atoms that have an odd number of protons or neutrons, they kind of have, they, they act as kind of tiny magnets because they, uh, because they have an odd number uh, of, the, of that odd number, okay? Uh, and one particular um, atom that's, um, that's very prevalent in the human body is the hydrogen atom, okay? And so the hydrogen atom makes up about 62% uh, of the mass inside a human. Mostly, most of that is due to water, okay? Uh, and because of that, then they can have their spin uh, mani uh, easily manipulated by an external magnetic field. And so when you go to when you go to get an MRI, um, so has anyone ever gotten an MRI before? That's good. That's good. So you you kind of sit in this kind of huge machine, um, and what's happening under uh, kind of while you're in that machine is that they're they're using these giant magnets to basically pass a magnetic field through your body. Okay. Uh, and these magnetic fields are you know they have a magnitude of you know somewhere either 1.5 tesla or 3 tesla. Okay. 
And when it does this, the hydrogen atoms inside your body will start to spin, okay? And this is kind of where the crazy part is, because when, when you pass a magnetic field through your body and your hydrogen atoms are spinning, it spins with a rotational frequency of about 64 and 128 megahertz, okay? And the reason these numbers are significant is because it just so happens that these are frequencies within the radio, within the radio frequency range, okay? Um, and so, you know, uh, because of that, you can kind of manipulate these spins by, um, by inputting other radio frequencies through your body, okay? And so, you know, an MRI, an MRI machine kind of has two parts. And so it has, first it has a giant magnet that, uh, that works on aligning the spins and kind of magnetizing all the hydrogen atoms in your body. Uh, and there's an RF transmitter uh, or radio frequency transmitter that aims to tilt these, uh, these, magnetic polar, um, these magnetic spins in a certain direction, okay? Uh, and depending on kind of the sequence of the, of the RF transmitter that you put in, then you can get different types of images inside your body, right? Uh, and so the, the fascinating thing is that, you know, there's, there's still a ton of research out there in, in terms of, you know, how we can manipulate this RF frequency in order to get you know, the best quality images out there. And, and li there's literally, you know, infinitely many different frequencies out there. And, um, you know, we, we, have, we have some standard frequencies that work for, you know, certain situations. But people are still kind of exploring others out there, um, and it's uh, it's it's a really really fascinating area of, of research. Okay. Uh, yeah, and so you know that's that's kind of the the the, the two minute summary of how MRIs work. Um, you know, unfortunately, we don't have much more time to go go through it, but um, you know, it is it is a really really fascinating technology, and the fact that someone came up with this, just the fact that you know when you magnetize hydrogen atoms. Um, that they just so happen to spin with this frequency that's that's in the radio frequency range is is you know either very very lucky but if you talk to the guy that said no I, I knew it I knew it all along so uh, so yeah it's uh, it's it's really cool uh, any questions on MRIs okay. the funny thing about MRI machines is that uh, it's it's not you not only know, have to pay for the machine you have to pay for a very specialized room to keep the machine in because uh, as you imagine you know because you're, you're you're basically creating a gigantic magnetic field you can't have anything metallic in that in that room otherwise it's going to go flying through the room or flying <laughs> through the windows and so it has to be within a very specially designed room that can kind of block the magnetic uh, magnetic waves from um, from inside um, just so that you know no chaos um, comes out of it so you know if you ever do get an mri you, you probably you probably you probably um have experienced this before they ask you you know do you have any uh, metal teeth do you have any braces do you have any pacemakers right because if you go if you go into an mri machine with the pacemaker it'll literally rip the pacemaker out of your body like that's how strong the the, the magnetic fields are they learn that from experience huh so did they ever learn that from experience i don't know i I've, <laughs> I've never seen it happen before but i imagine it's not a fun it's not fun for anyone <laughs> Why, why the pacemaker versus, is it like any metal it would rip out? Or? Any metal will rip out, but pacemaker is just one of the more common ones. It's just because like people, older people tend to have them and they kind of forget that they have them inside them. And so when they go inside, then they, you know, it, it, there's, you know, it, to my knowledge, I've, I've never seen it happen. I've never heard any stories of it happening, but it's, they, they ask you that like, you know, like five or six different times before you jump into you it. Like yeah, any, anything metal inside your body. Yeah, they ask, they ask about that. Yeah. Our question. So the radio frequencies can be converted to images and sound. Um, not sound so much, but uh, but but the images. Yeah. So basically, um, you know, the way the way it kind of works is that the um, the radio frequencies are pulsed through the body, um, and then you know, and then the hydrogen atom will also kind of you know emit kind of a pulse and kind of in response. And so you kind of have an RF transmitter and an RF receiver inside inside the MRI machine, and then based on those signals. Um, then they can reconstruct an image from from that. So, you know, again, again with CTs, you know, there's there's a lot of kind of um, back end image processing, um, you know, technology that goes on with it. But uh, um, but that's kind of the basics of, of how it works. Yeah. Okay. So next uh, next we have ultrasound. Um, so ultrasound is another um, imaging modality that we can have. Okay. And so the way ultrasound works is through um, using sound waves. Uh, and so an ultrasound, if, you, if you've ever gotten one before, they have like a little magic wand that they kind of, you know, put on your body. And then the wand kind of passes through, um, you know, um, sound waves. And they, it also kind of receives them, it receives them back as well. Okay. Uh, and the way it works is that, you know, sound wave, as sound waves pass through matter, 
um, then they either get scattered or reflected back to the transducer. Okay. And so what the what the ultrasound machine is doing is that it, it measures the time it takes for the reflected wave to come back, as well as the amplitude to see how much the wave is scattered. And they use that information to reconstruct the uh, reconstruct an image. Okay. Um, so ultrasound ultrasounds are are um, are uh, you know very popular, and so they um, you know mostly just because they're they're a lot cheaper, um, both in terms of cost of the machine, but also in cost of, of liability. And so you know they're very they're very very safe. And so there's um, you know uh, relative to the CT, which has radiate uh, which has radiation um, concerns, uh, MRI has uh, you know there's always concerns if there's anything metallic on, on the patient. Ultrasound, you know, there's there's not really much that can happen. It's a very it's very much like an in first in a, you know you go you go in you get an ultrasound and you're done in like 20 minutes. And so, you know, a lot of a lot of hospitals have these. Right? Um, the downside of ultrasound is that the image quality isn't that great. And so not only and so the the the, the struggle with ultrasounds is not really in, in giving it to the patient. It's in kind of interpreting what comes out of the ultrasound. And so, you know, if you if you look at this image down here, if you know. Honestly, if they didn't highlight some things in red and, and blue right here, I would have no idea what I'm looking at. And so uh, you need a really trained eye to really see, you know, what's going on with the, the ultrasound images. Okay. Yeah. Does it generally apply like the image? Uh, so you're talking about the gel that they apply onto, yeah. onto the skin? Yeah, it affects the, uh, it affects the, it, it makes sure basically that all the, all the sound waves that the ultrasound emits, it goes through the body. Because if you don't have that, then it, then you then the contact might not be that great between the probe and the body, and you might have some scattering outside uh, of the uh, from the probe. And so the gel just makes sure it kind of creates a nice surface, and the gel itself has some nice properties where it, it emits the sound waves you know, with, with with good consistency, uh, just to make sure you get a, get as high quality of an image as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's say the patient's like really hairy. Does the hair affect the uh, image? I think I think that's part of the gel as well. I think the gel oh, kind of helps with that. Uh, helps with that as well. Yeah. I haven't heard anything about that, but I think I think that's that's partially what the, the gel is for. Because uh, people have like dry skin and stuff like that too, so that, that affects it as well. And so uh, a, a really interesting extension to ultrasound that's happened in recent years is called Doppler ultrasound. Um, and so probably has does anyone remember the the Doppler effect from their physics classes before? So the Doppler effect is a, uh, you know, if so, the example I was left with the Doppler, the Doppler effect is if you're kind of standing on the sidewalk and you hear, you know, either a fire truck or a police or a police car with their sirens running running towards you, the sound kind of feels different as the car is approaching you versus when the car is getting away from you, right? And so the whole idea is that when you're when you're observing sound waves and the object that's emitting the sound is is moving, then the velocity of that object, you know, affects you know how, what you perceive as the, the frequency to be. Uh, and so we can actually make use of this effect um, with ultrasound as well, because you know we're basically doing the same thing. We're, we're we're using the ultrasound probe. We're emitting sound waves inside the body, but if those sound waves happen to hit something that's moving towards you or moving away from you, that's going to affect you know how uh, the frequency that you observe of the reflected wave that comes back. Okay. And so Doppler ultrasound actually utilizes this whenever you're trying to image blood flow, right? And so the primary thing that's moving inside your body is your is your blood and your cardiovascular system. And so if you aim the if you aim the ultrasound probe just right so that it kind of hits right onto the uh, right onto the blood vessel, then you can get it so that the that the the sound waves are are, are basically aimed right towards the the blood. And so if the blood's heading towards you, you know the speed of the blood is going to affect you know the, uh, the the sound waves that get reflected back. And then you can you can then take that information and, and kind of post process it back um, on the back end. Uh, to get some information for how fast the blood is, is flowing, um, either towards you or away, and so that's and so that's what you're viewing here in this image uh, for this Doppler ultrasound. Is that um, you know there? This is an image inside a person's heart, and so they use the the they use the ultrasound probe to see you know the velocity inside this person's heart is around 40 centimeters per second, um, uh, and this one is is fairly still, I'm guessing. Uh, so this is really this is really useful because you know before before this. You know, doctors didn't really have a way to to measure uh, blood velocity inside a person without you know basically cutting them up or sticking a probe inside them, right? Because uh, the thing with MRIs, or at least old school MRIs, and the thing with um, CTs is that they only take still images. And so the nice thing with ultrasounds, you can get a dynamic image and you can actually see you know how fast the blood is 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 flowing. So you know this is something that's really interesting. And I and I know I know for sure that this is often used in the uh, in the hospital. 
uh, to assess whether you have any kind of valve disease inside your uh, inside your heart. A quick question. Yeah. So that you said that that uh, that's the velocity of blood flow in your heart right there, that picture. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, we have a positive velocity and negative velocity. Yeah. A uh, positive exiting the heart and negative going in. It's I, so I think what you're viewing right here is kind of a cross section of the two chambers, and so um, you see here you have a, the left ventricle which is pumping blood, you know, kind of you can kind of think that's coming towards you, uh, which is pumping out the aorta, and then the the blue here, the blue you can kind of think of as pumping blood to your to your lungs, because that's the uh, um, oh, I'm sorry that's the that's the left atrium, yeah. So it's kind of I, I think it's kind of just a weird cross section where like kind of the the atrium is coming you know kind of surrounding the the left ventricle it's kind of making like a U shape like, like this. Um, okay, uh, so any other questions on, on ultrasound? Okay. All right, and so here's here's a table for uh, uh, for comparison in case in case you're curious. And so you know there's there's a lot of information on this table, but you know I think probably the thing that people are most curious about is is the is the cost. Okay. Right, and so there's a couple other uh, modalities here. So there's a spec scan and a pet pet scan. You might have, you might have heard of pet scans before. Um, you know, but we're, but in the interest of, of kind of time and, you know, and, and compared to these, they're, um, you know, they're used for more, for more other stuff. And so I fo I'm focusing mostly on just CT, MRI, and ultrasound. And so, you know, you can see the difference in cost. And so a CT scan uh, is only about, this is in euros, so about 200,000 euros. You compare that to an MRI machine, the cost is about six times as much. And so it's a, it's a big, significant, uh, significant cost. The cost of the machine or the cost to get it done to you? Cost of the machine. With the modern medical bills on it's hard to tell. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Um, you know this 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 table is a little bit old now, so maybe maybe it might be the cost of getting them now. I don't know, um, but I would hope not. But uh, I mean, if it's in euros, I mean, you have way better medical insurance than the old so <laughs> I, that. I mean this. I mean this table for sure is the cost of the machine. But this but this is from a textbook that was uh, from about ten years ago. So you know, of course, things things might change as well. All right, and what else? Uh, what else do I want to highlight? The other thing I want to highlight is this one right here. So this, so this uh, row right here is going to be particularly relevant for, for us um, because anytime you do any kind of imaging, and so even, even the imaging, like, you know, you take a picture on your phone, right? Uh, people are always thinking about what's the, what's the resolution or what's the size of the pixels that you can, um, that you can, that you can give, right? And so you can see here that CT has the best resolution because the, because, uh, uh, you know, the size of the pixels is only about half, you know, about half a millimeter wide. Whereas for MRI, the best you can do is about one millimeter, and so you know that's that's another big advantage that CT has over over MRI, over MRI is that uh, it has better spatial resolution, uh, and for and for a lot of applications, that spatial resolution is really 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 nice, uh, especially if you're trying to image you know this kind of the smallest blood vessels in your body. And so if you can imagine that if you have a blood vessel that's around one millimeter in diameter or or less than one millimeter. MRI might not even pick it up because you know it's smaller than the, the resolution of the image, or it might just show as kind of a splotchy kind of thing. Uh, whereas in CT, you know, you might you might still be able to pick that up. But, you know, that might be something that's that's really significant for uh, you know for the disease you're trying to diagnose. Okay. All right, and so uh, and and for uh, if you're curious, you know, the only one that has radiation is CTs because they work off of X-ray technology, but MRI and 3D ultrasound, you know, there's no uh, there's no radiation for that. Uh, I think that's that's everything I want to to mention here. Oh, uh, this is another this is another interesting one too. Acquisition time, and so acquisition time um, basically refers to how long it takes for that um, for that uh, for that technique to, to create an image of your of your body, or at least one 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 unit of an image. And so another another factor for MRIs is that they're really really slow. Um, and so it's 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 much better nowadays. It, it doesn't take you know twenty minutes, but it's still you kind of have to sit there for, for kind of a while in order for it to generate its image. Whereas a CT scan, you know, they kind of go through it very very quickly because it's it's based on it's just based on X-rays. All right. Uh, any questions on on this? Okay. All right. So those are so those are the three I think techniques that people kind of first think about when they think of medical imaging. And so these are these are all what I like to call non-invasive imaging, right? And so there is, um, you know, when you get a CT scan, when you get, when you get an MRI, when you get an ultrasound, you know, you don't have anything entering you or invading your, invading inside your body. Um, 
but there's other types of uh, imaging modalities where which are called invasive um you know which which do enter your body and so uh the first one i want to talk about is catheters and so this is probably you know by far the most common one and so the catheter is basically just a small wire um that they stick inside your body and so the joke so the joke i always make is that catheters they always go up your butt and then they kind of sneak around to the rest of your body um which does happen but but, but it doesn't happen all that much for cardiovascular so usually if they're sticking a, a catheter up your butt they're looking at something in your intestines or your stomach because that's that's kind of the easiest way to get to your gastrointestinal uh, tract um, usually if they want to look at something in your cardiovascular system they're sticking the catheter up your thigh because the thigh kind of has this really big blood vessel that's kind of easy to hit and so they kind of insert the catheter there and they kind of they kind of uh, snake the catheter up to wherever other part they need to in the body so um, it's really interesting actually I, i've seen i've seen surgeons do this where they you know it's it, it's it's a really interesting um way that they control it because they basically just kind of control it they kind of just shimmy it from the outside and so it's not really a, it's not really a, a sophisticated system they're just really good at you know once that's inside your body they kind of just shimmy it they try to kind of guide it to the to wherever it needs to go and sometimes they need it to go to your heart and so they you know imagine trying to shimmy a small wire like that up your bag up around to your heart it's 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 pretty it's pretty impressive right? Are patients unconscious? sometimes <laughs> Um, and so some, and so, I mean, they're de most definitely going to be numb. And so the, the area around there is just so they won't be, so they won't have uh, feeling there. Um, most times they'll, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, most of the times they'll, they'll have, um, laughing gas and so they, they'll still be awake, but you know, they just won't be kind of aware, uh, but they can still answer questions. Um, you know, and sometimes that's necessary too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why am I chest tickle? Yeah. It's. When you insert that into like it goes, it goes into your bloodstream. It does. Right? Yep. When you insert that, is there a possibility of getting like an air bubble into your system? Yeah. No, it's a good question. So that's that's all. That's definitely always a big concern whenever you have you know something that's entering your your blood vessel is, um, you know, if, are you going to create like an air bubble or an infection is another uh, important concern too. Um, but you know these these people are, are highly trained and so you know if they. If something does happen, then they, there's tools that are there for them to uh, to make sure it doesn't happen. Do they just like stick it in and hope you don't get an air bubble, or is there like something that prevents it from having air bubbles? Uh, I think I'm sure I'm sure the technique they use um, prevents it. I, I'm not I'm not exactly sure what the technique actually is. I've I've only just seen it from out. They they never let they never let the engineer into the operating room. They only let you watch on the outside because they think they think you're going to screw something up or touch something. And so the, the from the way I've seen it, they just kind of you know they kind of just kind of stick it in there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And so the, the cool thing about catheter is, is that, um, you know, you can, you can kind of stick almost any kind of device at the end of it. And so, uh, you know, and they've, they've stuck a lot of things at the end of the catheter. And so kind of the more common ones would be something like a camera. And so if they wanted to see, you know, what's, what the inside of your heart looks like, see what the health of your valve is, they might, they might, put, a they might put a camera on the end of a catheter just so the surgeon can kind of see. Uh, sometimes they might put a pressure meter. And so if they want to measure like a, a more direct, um, you know, value of your, of your blood pressure inside your heart, that's something that they would do. Same thing with the flow meter. And so they can measure like the, uh, the volumetric flow rate of blood. Um, sometimes even something as simple as a light they can put in there, uh, especially if they're doing surgery. Um, and of course they can put surgical tools. And so they can put, you know, scissors, they can put scalpels, you know, whatever they need to at the end of it. Yeah. Um, um, the name is escaping me, but the uh, there's there's a type of arthrosco there's a type of surgery called arthroscopic surgery, you know, which is actually just performed with with catheters like this and kind of minimally minimally invasive. They call it minimally invasive. Um, and so if they have to do something, you know, inside your your gastrointestinal system, you know, then you know, in the old ways, the way they would do, they would literally just kind of cut you up, just kind of make a huge cut there, and then the surgeons would kind of go in and, and do that, uh, do what they need to do. Um, but of course, nowadays, no one, no one wants to be cut up like that unless they really need to. And so the more popular way to do this is through kind of small incisions. So they kind of make a small incision inside your body. They put a, they put a, a probe in there. They put a catheter. Maybe they put two or three. Um, and, then they, and then they do what they need to with only making small incisions on the inside of your body. So, um, and, that's, and that's, you know, a lot more, a lot nicer because you're probably in and out of the hospital. Maybe, one, maybe you spend one night tops. Um, but if, you know, that's, that's much better than a full open surgery where you're probably in the hospital for at least a week. Um, and particularly for this class, you know, um, uh, catheters can also deploy some, some medical devices too. 
Uh, and so I'm sure a lot of you probably wrote, wrote about stents or artificial valves in your first homework. And so the main way that stents and artificial valves are deployed um, is through a catheter. Uh, okay, any questions on, on this? Okay. All right. Uh, and so catheters can also be used to, to produce um, some really cool imaging as well. And so there's a couple techniques um, called IVIS and OCT. Okay, so IVIS stands for intravascular ultrasound, and OCT stands for optical uh, coherence tomography. Okay. Uh, and so the idea is that, you know, if, if we're going to have our, uh, our, um, our catheter inside the person's body anyway, you know, maybe let's try taking some um, some medical imaging from the inside. Okay, um, and the nice thing about this is that this gives you really high resolution images um, of things like the vesicle cross section, um, and so that's kind of what you're seeing here. And so basically, you know, the way that these images were produced is that the catheter was was stuck inside a person's body, and the wire is kind of sitting right in the middle of, of the blood vessel, right? And so if you imagine the blood vessel is kind of like a tube, then the wire is kind of sitting right in the middle. And the way it produced these images was that the catheter kind of emitted infrared light all around it so that you get this really nice image of this, uh, of this cross section, okay? And normally this is really, really hard to do. And so to get the exact cross-sectional shape and the cross-sectional area, uh, normally this is, this is hard because even with, even with the camera, right? And so, you know, the cameras, you know, you put a camera inside the person's body and it's kind of going all over the place. And, you know, it, it's hard to get a good, you know, image of what the cross section looks like, and especially what the cross section size is. And so using a technique like IVIS will, will give you this cross sectional shape. And a lot of times doctors can take this shape and say, you know, this is the kind of disease that you have. And, you know, this is the kind of operation you need to, you need to perform. Uh, and so they both they both work very similarly. It's just the way that they, they the way that they obtain the images is is uh, is slightly different. Uh, and so you know, um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, IBIS uses ultrasound, and then OCT uses uh, infrared infrared light. Okay. Um, all right. And so and so you know specifically what you're seeing in these images here, and and the reason they have these arrows. And so these arrows are kind of indicating where the plaque buildup and when, where, the, uh, uh, where the disease is in the artery, right? And so what you can kind of see, it's, it's a little bit hard to see here, but I think maybe it's clearer on this bottom one. This wall right here where the arrows are, it's a little bit thicker than, than the rest of the rest of the vessel. And it kind of, um, you know, there's kind of a little dip in this, uh, in this wall right here. Right? And so, you know, most of this vessel looks pretty healthy to me, but then once it kind of gets to this, you kind of have this kind of flat plaque cap, right? And that's where the cardiovascular disease is, and so that's that's what the uh, um, that's what the image is, is trying to uh, uh, trying to show. Okay. And normally this is normally this is very hard uh, to do, you know, even with like CT images um, and otherwise, because you know knowing exactly where the plaque is and, and what effect that's having on the shape, you know, this is normally very very hard to to do. All right. Any questions on on this? Okay, and so let's talk about some applications. Um, and we've we've kind of been discussing it just kind of in general, but let's uh, um, let's talk about it just uh, more specifically. Okay, so the biggest uh, and so the biggest um, application for doing any medical imaging is to get uh, information about geometry and motion. Okay, um, and so by geometry I mean you know what's the shape of the person's blood vessels? You know, um, is there any disease in them? Um, you know, um, what direction is the blood flowing? So all of this is information you can get from, from medical imaging um, that you wouldn't be able to get otherwise by, uh, uh, by just looking at a person, right? Um, and there's a lot of great applications of this. And so, you know, if you, if you do some uh, medical imaging, so you say you, you get a CT scan, um, you can view things like cardiovascular plaque, right? And so those are, those are things like disease in your blood vessels. Uh, and those are usually visualized as like a narrowing of your, of your blood vessel, okay? Um, another thing that you can see is you can see how much, uh, how much volume you have inside your heart. And so that'd be like the ventricular uh, volume. Okay. Uh, another really interesting application is viewing aneurysms. Okay? And so aneurysms are, are these kind of blood filled sacs that kind of form in your blood vessels that are, that are normally very unnatural. Um, and so, you know, your, your blood vessel shouldn't, shouldn't balloon up at all. So it should still, you should be a relatively straight tube. Okay. Uh, so aneurys when aneurysms form up, you know that's something that's really important for uh, for the doctors to know, uh, and they can get that information from the from the medical imaging. Okay, um, these are especially actually harm, more most harmful in the brain because what can happen is if you have an aneurysm in your brain, 
it's it's kind of you know I've I've heard people say that you know when when uh, when people get upset they're like oh don't don't pop an aneurysm in your brain. Um, you you actually can't get an aneurysm from getting angry. You know I don't know that might be a misconception nowadays, but uh, but you know don't don't worry about it. Aneurysms form uh, from it for a different reason. Um, but when they do form, it's important to to uh, to see them because if they burst, then you know most of the time you're you're probably you're probably dead. So um, you need to find out where those aneurysms are you know, as soon as possible. Um, they're very important for, for newborns because a lot of times you can um, you can see if there's any kind of a malformation, and so if the, if the heart or you know maybe the blood vessels are not forming correctly inside a inside a baby, they can use medical imaging to see that. Um, and you can also just view the cardiac motion, so you can see you know how 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 well your your heart is uh, how well your heart is pumping. All right, uh, any questions on this? All right, so another useful application is blood velocity. And so we talked about this a little bit uh, with the Doppler ultrasound, uh, but measuring the blood velocity is, is, you know, has a lot of really interesting applications, um, you, know, for, uh, um, you know, for your health. Uh, and so the first, the first one, and probably the most common one that people do is they check, they check inside your heart for, for valve health, okay? Um, and so what you can do is you, if you position, the, if you position an, an, ultra pound, an ultrasound probe, such that you're kind of viewing the back end of a uh, of a valve, then you can use it to see if there's any kind of backflow coming back through the valve. Right? But the way the valves work is that when they when they close, they should not allow any flow to come back through come back through that chamber. Uh, but with people with disease valves, their valves may not close all the way, and they might allow some blood back through. Right? And so the way the doctors can, can diagnose that, the way that they can see it, uh, is you know one way is through ultrasound, and so they can see you know are you getting if we if we if we look at the flow of blood through this valve, is it all going in the correct direction, or are you having some that's coming back? And so that's one way that they can they can view it. Okay. Uh, and they can also view the uh, the blood flow waveforms of certain arteries just to see just to you know assess if it's getting the right amount of flow uh, that it needs to. Okay. And so in fact, I think that's what you're seeing right here. And so this uh, and so this velocity waveform, I believe, is a uh, measure of the uh, blood flow in your coronary artery. Uh, so your coronaries are the, the blood vessels that actually wrap, they wrap around your heart. Uh, and they're the ones that actually feed your heart and muscle. And so, you know, these are very, very important arteries. And so measuring the, the velocity in these blood vessels and making sure that they're getting the right amount of blood, you know, is something that's, uh, you know, that's really important. Uh, any questions on, on this? Uh, and the last and the last application I'll talk about is is you know kind of still still kind of an area of research right now. People are still trying to figure out how to best use this. Um, is what I like to call functional imaging. Okay? And so functional imaging is is kind of a um, an application of medical imaging that not only provides geometric information, not only provides velocity, uh, but also provides information on kind of the biological processes that are happening inside your body as well. Okay. Uh, and so one of uh, one of the more mature types of, uh, of functional imaging is called perfusion. Uh, and so the idea with perfusion is that they, they inject a contrast agent into your blood, uh, and then they see how that contrast agent kind of um, you know kind of uh, perfuses into your muscles or perfuses into the organs where it needs to go. Okay. Um, because ideally, you know, when your when your blood passes through you know your various muscles and organs, you know that blood should go kind of everywhere inside the organ, and so it should kind of reach everywhere that it needs to. Um, and so for people that, uh, that are not, that don't have, you know, healthy kidneys or something like that, you know, the blood might not be getting to all the areas of the kidneys that, that it needs to. And perfusion imaging can be used to see, you know, what areas of the kidneys need some help or, or not. Okay. Uh, next is a, uh, type, is a type of imaging called myocardial architecture. Okay. Uh, and so this is a, this is a technique to, to measure the, the microcirculation around the heart. And so all the capillaries and all the really tiny vessels around the heart um, normally are, are very difficult to image um, because, you know, they're, I mean, first of all, the vessels are really small, uh, but your heart is constantly moving as well. And so to get, and so, you know, whenever you're measuring something really small, it, it helps if that thing is, stays still. Um, but for something like the heart, which is constantly moving, you, you need a very specialized technique to, to view it. And so uh, this myocardial architecture is, is um, you know, is, is aiming to do that. But, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how how advanced that uh, that technique is yet. Okay. Uh, another technique that's really interesting is inflammation imaging, and so uh, inflammation is is something that happens a lot in your body. And so 
whenever uh, you know whenever your body senses something there's something wrong in a certain area, uh, that area gets inflamed, right? And so if you have like an infection or if you have like a if you have like a like a sprain or something like that, then you'll you'll know that th that area gets inflamed and it gets kind of painful to touch. Right? Um, and so there's uh, there's some techniques on on using some medical imaging to assess you know how bad the inflammation is in a certain area. All right, any, uh, any um, questions on this before we move on? Okay. All right, and so uh, before we move on to the next set of lecture notes, I do want to um, show you how, where to go to install the software, okay? And so I know most of you don't have your laptops right now, but, but that's okay. So I'll, I'll, you know, I'll take this part of the lecture, I'll, I'll clip it on YouTube, and then I'll, I'll, send it, I'll send it out to everyone, okay? Is there a long download? It is, and so we're, and so you know, it's uh, it's not something that we can just you know we can do at the beginning of class, and so it's, it's going to be something you're going to have to do on your on your own. Uh, so I, I want to show you where to go now, um, because there's a couple packages that you need to install, um, just so that you can kind of um, go home and do it yourself. All right, and so uh, let's go ahead and open up a web browser, okay. and the website that you want to go to is called simvascular.org. So let me move this to the right a little bit. So I'm going to go www.simvascular.org, okay? okay? And so it's going to take you to the site. And so the way you know that you're there is that it should say Simvascular in gigantic freaking letters. And so if you if you see that, then you're you're good to go. I've I've told my advisor to change this because it's 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 so tacky. But you know she's not a she's an engineer. She's not a graphic designer. So okay. And so this website is going to be, you know, where you're going to visit this website a lot um, in this uh, in this class, okay? And so this is going to be your 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 uh, one stop shop for um, you know for all of the uh, um, you know for all for everything that has to do with the project, basically, okay? Um, and so if you kind of remember from the beginning, you know, the idea with the project is that you're going to construct you know a model that looks like this, which is basically a 3D CAD model of of, of someone's blood vessels. And we're going to run a CFD simulation of the of the blood that's going through it. Okay? And so if you kind of if I can play this animation, okay. And so you're going to produce basically something like this, right? And so what this is in particular, this is someone's aorta, and so this is the main blood vessel that comes off their heart. And what you're viewing right now is a CFD simulation. And so when the when the image is lighting up red, that's when the heart is beating. And so when the heart beats, it's going to pump out blood out through the uh, out through the aorta. And that blood is gonna is gonna run through the rest of the, of the blood vessel. Okay. And the way that you're gonna construct this image is you're gonna you're gonna do it based off someone's real you know medical image data. Okay. And so you're gonna, it's it's based on you know their CT scan. And so these are real people that uh, um, that you're that you're getting um, data from, uh, which is not easy to obtain because you know most people um, are very uh, um, you know. Very protective of their medical image of their medical data, which is you know which is understandable. And so, you know, it, it is difficult often to get these kinds of data. So, you know, the fact that we have you know a lot for you guys to choose from in the class is is, is, is actually really nice. Okay. Um, don't ask me what's ha what's happening to these people. And so, I I don't know if they're still alive or if they're doing okay now. And so, part of the deal is that you know we never meet them and they never meet us. And so, you know, that's how we can get their <laughs> that's how we can get their medical images. So, I have no idea how any of these people are doing, but. I do know that they are real people that they, uh, you know, that we got their, their information. Okay. And so, um, you know, we're going to come here and, and, you know, when we do our workshop next week, we're going to, we're doing it based off the online tutorials and there's two of them. And so I, I think there's, there should only be one. They need to pay the interns some more because I think they need to, they need to work on this website, but basically you're going to go to download. Okay. Right. And then you're going to go to this uh, part of the, um, um, of the download here, because what you want to do is you want to download the installation package. Okay. And so if you do that, it's actually going to take you to a different website called SimTK. Okay. And in order to download this, uh, in order to download um, SimFastCore here, you, you're going to need to make an account. Okay. Uh, and so you need you're going to need to sign up. And don't worry, it's 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 not it's, they don't spam you. This is this is an NSF organization, and so you know they don't uh, they're not trying to sell you anything or anything like that, and they're not they're not selling that data. Not to my knowledge, but um, but you're going to need to sign up so that you can download these um, these these packages. Okay. And the nice thing about Simvascular is that we have we have uh, installers for for Mac, we have installers for Linux uh, for if you're running Ubuntu, and we have installers for Windows as well. Okay. 
And so you can see the most recent release here which was, was from September 2021. Okay. And so if you go ahead and click on this link right here, you can you can download the uh, um, you know uh, the packages. And so it looks like there uh, for September there wasn't a Windows release. Uh, and so if you're using Windows, you're going to have to go to an older release. Okay. I have no idea what that is. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, I see. Okay. So for uh, if you want if you want a previous release, you're going to have to click on this one right here. Okay. And so under previous releases, let's check June 2021. Okay. Uh, and looks like for June 2021, we have all three versions available. Okay. And so you can use this version right here if you if you're using Windows. Okay. And so all you have to do is you just simply download it and then you run the exe um, and then it's going to install some vascular on your computer and then um, you can just uh you know just follow all the prompts on it looks like a scam website it's not a scam website trust me yeah it's uh if it was i'd probably be fired from this from this job so yeah uh yeah you can you can just you can just use your school email yeah 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 that would be that would be most preferable too because um you know, then then they know you're an educational. Then they know you're an educational user, and that's good. That's good for PR. It's like you know, we're using this. You know, students are learning a lot of good stuff from this, and yada 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 stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. So go, just go ahead and sign up with your with your school email, and then download the the um, the package here. And so if you're running Mac, um, I would actually recommend you you download the latest release uh, because then you know there's there's probably they probably fixed a bunch of bugs here. Uh, but if you're running Windows, unfortunately, you're you're gonna, you're gonna have to use the release from June 2021. But they both, but, but for what we're going to do, that should work fine. Okay. And so that's the first thing you have to download. And so you're going to have to download some vascular. Okay. Uh, and so that's That's going to get you, that's going to get you started with, uh, you know, with all of the, the model building, which is like the CAD part of the software. Uh, but it's not going to have the simulation. It's not going to have the CFD tool. In it. And so to get to download the CFD tool, you're going to need to download this part right here called SV solver. And so we're not going to run the CFD until until you know much later in the semester. I think not until after spring break. Uh, but if you want to just you know have everything installed um, at once, you can download that as well. Okay. And oh, there's a new release. And so it was just released uh, just released this month. Okay. Uh, and so oh, only for Mac, of course. Okay. And so if you um, uh, if you want to download the CFD code right now, you can go ahead and um, download that. And the installation should be exactly the same. Okay. And so again, if you're running Windows um, or if you're running Linux, you're gonna have to look at a previous release. It looks like the last one that came out was even before this. The last one that came out was June 2019. Okay, so if you're if you're running Windows, but um, but I, I assume I assume it's work. It's it's still the same because I've I've worked I've worked on this code and there's code in there from like 1977. It's so. Um, you know, I, I don't imagine it much has changed with uh, with the CFD code. Can okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so to get to this page, you're first going to go to www.simvascular.org. Okay. And then you're going to click on download. And then you're going to click on download installation package. Right? You have to sign in to do it, right? Yeah, you have to sign, you have to sign in to, uh, to download it. Yeah. You sign into SimTK. You don't sign into SimVascular. Yeah. And then for the tutorial, um, I click on first one. Okay, they're the same thing. Okay. All right. And so for the tutorials, um, you know, we're going to download the. Um, there's an example project, and so um, if you go here, okay. Uh, and so after after you're done installing, you can click on this next code right here, or this, this next button called Download Example Projects, and we're going to run the tutorial project in our workshop next week. And so if you go to um, here, and you click on demo project, that's not what I want. They changed the website. Where did they put the, uh, where did they put the freaking projects? Oh, right here. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. And so when you, uh, when you go to uh, this download example projects, it's going to take you back to SimTK. And the one I want you to download is the, um, the demo project right here. Okay. And this, this part we can do together in class, but the, but the, the main thing I want you to do, you know, before next week 
is to um, basically install Simvassar on your on your computer. Okay, I can't do it here because this is the this is the lectern computer. But uh, um, you know, go ahead and give it a try. And then if you if you run into any installation issues, just just let me know, and then I can I can help you out kind of on an individual basis. Okay. All right. Um, any questions on on that? All right, and so um, and so I'll go ahead and clip this, and I'll put I'll put the instructions into a document too, just so it's easier for you to reference. Um, and then by next week, uh, I think probably probably on Tuesday we'll do the we'll do the workshop. Um, if you can have it installed before Tuesday, then you know then we'll be in good shape for the, for the workshop. All right, so let me go ahead and stop sharing this. Let me bring back the iPad. Just to confirm, there was something after Simvascore. Yeah, so after Simvascore, there was something called SV Solver that I want you to download. So Simvascore is kind of like you can think of Simvascore as like the CAD software, okay. and then SV Solver is the CFD software that goes on. Yeah, I'll, I'll write it down. Here. Okay, so the first thing I want you to download and install is Simvascore. So this is like the CAD software. Okay. And so this is what we're going to use to, to build our CAD models. And the other thing, uh, the other thing I want you to download is SV Solver. So this is the CFD. And so again, you know, we're not going to use SV Solver until until much later in the semester. But if you just want to install everything up front and then you know, not have to worry about it, then you can do it. Uh, you can just do it all right. All right. Okay. And so uh, we're going to go ahead and move on. And so the next uh, the next topic I want to go over in the uh, in the class is uh, basically we're going to start talking about biomechanics for the first time. Okay. And in particular, we're going to talk about the biomechanics of the arterial system. So I believe this is lecture note zero five on the uh, from the from the Canvas site. Okay, it has to do with arterial biomechanics. Okay, uh, and so so far, you know, uh, in terms of the theory that we've gone over in the class, we've 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 basically just done a review of of three thirty three. So we've just done a review of fluid mechanics, uh, along with some a little bit extra stuff. So things like Murray's law and things like um, you know and things like um, the wall shear stress. Okay? But these are these have all been kind of purely mechanical uh, mechanical concepts, right? And so they're all just basically fluid mechanics, as well as some kind of little extension on fluid mechanics. It's all been um, all been you know purely kind of physics kind of stuff. Okay. And so what I want to talk about this week is you know how can we take a lot of those concepts of like wall shear stress, of things like flow rate, and things like pressure, and you know and talk about how they relate to the actual biology inside inside a person's body. And so that's the idea with uh, um, with this. And so the first thing, uh, first thing I want to talk about is um, low and pressure waveform inside your blood vessels. And so what do, what do I mean by waveforms? And so, um, you know, the, the, probably the, the biggest feature that people notice about a blood flow in the cardiovascular system is that it's pulsatile. Okay. In other words, you know, things like the pressure, things like the flow inside your, inside your, inside your body, you know, it's, it's, it's never constant, right? And so, 
it kind of rises and falls, you know, along with the with the beating of your heart. Okay. Because your your blood, you know, your um, your blood is 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 circulating through your body, you know, from your heart, right? And so the heart's basically the, the pump of your of your entire cardiovascular system. Um, but the way the, the your heart works, is that it works on kind of a, a, a pulsing kind of nature. And so you know, the heart has kind of two phases. And so there's a phase where it's actively contracting, right? So it's actively squeezing. And so the cardiac muscles in the heart are actually kind of squeezing, literally squeezing the blood out the, the heart and through the rest of your body. Uh, but in order for it to contract again, it has to relax, right? And so there's a phase of contraction and relax, relax, relaxation, contraction, relaxation, okay? And that kind of cycle creates this pulsatile nature and blood flow, okay? And we talked about, you know, what these phases um, are called or what their, what their kind of biological names are, okay? Heart will not contraction, it's weird. Heart will contract. Okay. And so when a heart contracts, remember this is called systole. And relax. Okay. And the relaxation part is called diastole. Okay. So systole, diastole, systole, diastole. Okay. And of course, you know, this uh, this pulse cell nature is going to have an effect on you know what the pressure waveforms and what the flow waveforms look like. Okay. And so in other words, you know, they have an effect of what the uh, of you know how the pressure in your body varies with time. Okay. And so let's look at the pressure first. Okay. And so on the y-axis here we have pressure. Okay. And on the x-axis here we have time. Some common units for uh, for time. We're just going to use simply seconds because that's that's kind of how quickly things happen in the, uh, in the cardiovascular system. Okay. For pressure, we're going to use um, kind of the the uh, uh, the medical standard for pressure, which is millimeters of mercury. Okay. And so the uh, the symbol for that is mmHd. Okay. And so if you if you measure the pressure waveforms inside a person's body, you know they would look something like like this. Okay. And so it would first arc upwards, okay, very rapidly, and it would start to trend downwards. It has this little notch right here, okay. and then it has kind of a slow decrease right here. Okay. All right, and so we could we could break this up into into phases, okay. And so let me use right for this, okay. okay. And so in this area right here that I'm kind of uh, I've kind of broken off in red, this right here is systole, okay? Right. Whereas the, uh, the other side, when uh, the pressure waveform is going down, this is diastole, okay? Right, and so the pressure inside your body is gonna spike upwards when, um, during systole, so when the heart is contracting, then the pressure is gonna reach a maximum. Then when the heart is relaxing, it's going to um, decay downwards in diastole. Okay. All right. And so that makes sense, right? And so if you squeeze, you know, if you if you have a uh, you know, if you even if you even if you have a closed system, I think think of like a water balloon, right? And so if you have a water balloon filled with water and you squeeze it, right, then of course the pressure inside that water balloon is going to go up because you're 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 applying some pressure on the outside. But when you release that, when you let the water balloon relax, then that pressure gets alleviated and the pressure goes down. Okay. Why would you have that slight jump in pressure with your heart contracting? This, uh, you mean this little notch right here? Yeah. So that's that's a that's a that's a great observation. So this is what's known as the aortic notch. And so that's a result of your aortic valve closing. And so um, right at the outlet of your heart, there's a there's a valve called the aortic valve. And that's to make sure that you know once the blood leaves your heart, it doesn't come back in. And so that's and so that's one of the biggest kind of beefiest valves in your body. 
And so when it closes, then it kind of leaves like a like a like a clicking sound inside your inside your body. And so actually, you know, when you, when you actually feel your or you, when you actually listen to someone's heartbeat, you know, with a stethoscope or something, like it always sounds like but don't but don't but don't. That second dump is actually when the aortic valve is closing. And so that's kind of the most, the high, the most, um, the most, um, the biggest thing that you can hear inside a person's uh, blood vessel. Cause it's, it's literally, you know, big flaps kind of closing in on itself. Really quickly. All right, question. So aren't there two systoles, the atrium and then the ventricle? Yeah, that's a good question. So when we, when we talk about systole, we, we primarily just talk about the, uh, the ventricles. Um, and so when you're, uh, and they, and they, and they contract together. And so your left ventricle and your right ventricle, they kind of contract together at the same time. Um, the atria, the atria don't contract that much. They're, they're not, they're not nearly as muscular as the ventricle, although they do have some contraction action. Um, and that happens kind of right, kind of right at the tail end of, of diastole. So, um, kind of around here, you know, which is kind of when the, uh, which is kind of when the, when the ventricles are kind of filling with blood again. This is when the atria kind of they kind of squeeze a little bit, and so I think I think if you talk to doctors, they don't talk about atrial contraction because it's they don't really they're not really that muscular, but they do they do kind of you know squeeze a little bit to kind of just get the last last bit of blood into the ventricles. But it, it happens um, right before right before the ventricles open, so it kind of happens very very quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so that's the pressure waveforms. We can also do the same thing with flow. Okay. Right, and so common um, common units for flow is usually measured in milliliters per second. Okay. Right, and so if you measure the flow um, right outside your heart then it would look something like this. And so you'd have flow that comes up really quickly during systole, okay. Then it's gonna come back down, okay. Then it's gonna be almost no flow, just like that, okay. And so we can mark this off the same way. And so during this, during this portion right here, this here is systole, right? So this makes a lot of sense. And so when your heart is contracting and it's squeezing blood out, then the flow is gonna be highest because the blood is actually coming out of your heart. Uh, but when the heart is relaxing and the valve is closed, then, then no flow is gonna come out, okay? And again, you have this little notch right here, you know, where you have kind of a, a little period, a little, a slight period of, of, of backflow uh, because when the valve closes, it kind of takes, it kind of takes a little bit of the blood back with it just because, you know, the blood that didn't quite escape the heart kind of comes back because the valve is, is kind of closing. And so you kind of, there's kind of very, a very visual aortic notch here as well. Okay. And then of course we have diastole. And so when the heart is relaxing, it's not pumping any blood, then you're not gonna see any blood flow that's coming out, coming out of the heart, okay. And so these right here would be like the flow and pressure waveforms you would observe Kind of right, right outside the heart. Okay. All right. Any questions on on this? Okay. All right. And so these, and so, you know, I, I, I drew these diagrams here or these waveforms because I think they, they illustrate uh, kind of the main behaviors that you generally expect um, out of these waveforms. Um, but, you know, the exact waveforms that you, that you measure are going to be different depending on what part of the body that, you, that you're observing, okay? Okay. Okay. 
Uh, and in fact, there's there's some trends. And so as you as you get further away from the heart, and so you know, if let's say that you measure these waveforms in your hand or in your foot, right? Then you're going to absorb observe um, some different some different shape of waveforms. It'll have a lot of the same characteristics, but some of the but, but the exact shape is going to change. Right? And so we can talk about you know just generally how these um, how these behaviors are. Okay. And so generally, as you get further away from the heart. Couple of things happen, and so the first thing that you um, that you observe is that the peak systolic pressure, uh, or the peak or the peak pressure that happens in the waveforms, those tend to increase as you get further away from the heart. Right. Uh, and there's a and there's a very there's a very interesting physical reason of, of why that happens. Uh, we won't get to it today, but we will get to it uh, next week. Okay. Uh, number two, uh, the flow tends to uh, tends to go down. Question. So further away means along the arteries. That's correct. Yeah. And so if you kind of if you kind of think of the heart as kind of the starting point um, for the blood, and then as it circulates through, you know, um, through your arms, through your head, through your legs, then that's what I mean by as it gets further away from the heart. Okay. That's interesting. It's the slower velocity that there's an increase in pressure. Yeah. You would think it would be like not like that, right? Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting, and the, and the main reason behind that is, is mostly because the your blood vessels are, are flexible, and so what tends to happen is, the, yeah, so uh, so we'll uh, so to kind of give you a preview, we, we won't be able to get into it today, but because your your blood vessels are flexible, then you have these pressure waves that kind of travel along the walls of your heart, and so every time your heart beats, there's kind of a pressure wave, you know, it travel it travels in the fluid, but there's also like a pressure pulse that travels along the vessel walls, but then once the, that once that pressure pulse kind of reaches the end of the tree. Like once it reaches the capillaries, it tends to reflect back, and so when they reflect back, then they kind of join together with the with the forward waves, and they kind of amplify each other. Yeah, yeah, very, very. It's a very, very interesting phenomenon. Um, so the increase in pressure could be associated with the size getting smaller. That's that's part of it too. And so that that also adds to the wave propagation effect. And so it's a combination of, of you know the the size of the vessels getting smaller, but also this idea that you know pressure waves will travel along the, the flexible walls. All right, so the flow tends to go down, uh, and the main reason for this is actually because of the of, of you know of the vessels getting smaller, and so you know if you imagine you know your your the starting point for your blood is this this giant thick aorta, and then it's going to bifurcate and split off, and so just by nature of, of just splitting off into so many different paths, then the flow has to go down. Okay. Yeah. Our uh, second scavenging. Uh, I'm not familiar with that. What is what is that? Uh -huh. uh -huh. I see. I see. It could. I, I think I'd, I'd have to research that a little bit more just to kind of give a, a, a better answer for that. But it's it's, it's not, it sounds similar though, just kind of based on based on what you're telling. Yeah, because what you're saying is that when it's yeah. the pressure waves are going to reflect. Yeah. Yeah. The re the reflection is more due to the fact that when you get to the smallest capillaries, it's not that they're really small, but they're really rigid, and so the the capillaries are actually really rigid compared to like a bigger blood vessel, and so it's almost like the pressure waveform hits a wall. And then it, after it hits the wall, then it comes back and, and amplifies. But but the size of the vessel also has an impact on on, on the speed of how the the waveforms go as well. So that would be a little more. Um. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Uh, and so just as a natural consequence of the vessels getting smaller and, 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 and they branch out more. Okay. And so just as a natural consequence of conservation of mass and the flow has to go down, okay. Another interesting thing that, uh, um, that happens is, um, is the, the flow waveform tends to, tends to flatten. Right, so not only do they get smaller, but they also kind of do this like flattening thing. And so what do I mean by that? And so, you know, the flow, wa the flow waveform that I'm, I'm showing you up here is kind of the most extreme case where it's right outside the heart. But actually, as you get further away from the heart, the flow waveform kind of looks more like, like this. And so it'll have a it'll have a it'll have a peak when the when the um, when the heart is beating, of course. Let me draw this a little bit better. And so it'll, there will be a peak when the heart beats, but it's not going to decrease down to zero. Okay. And so if you drew if you drew the uh, um, the waveform near the heart, you know it would, it would probably look something like this, right? And so near the heart, it go up really rapidly and then come down to almost zero, okay? But as you get further away, you know, of course the peak is gonna go down, but you can see here that we, we still have some flow here in diastole, okay? And this flow is, is actually nearly, nearly constant, okay? And so even though your, your, your heart is pumping and you know, even though your, your aorta only fills with blood during this first stage, you know, there's actually a, almost a near constant or near mean flow in some of your smaller arteries, okay? Uh, and that's, and that's, uh, that's really nice because then, you know, if you imagine that your, your blood can only move through your system when your heart beats, then you might have spurts of like, you know, your muscle will be, you know, it'll get a rush, a rush of blood and then no blood, rush of blood, no blood. And so this feature of, of you know, having your, your smaller blood vessel kind of maintain a constant flow is, is, is really nice, okay? And that almost seems like a, it almost seems like a paradox, right? And so if, you're, if, you're, if your heart is only pumping blood whenever it contracts, you know, how can, there be, how can there be a near constant flow when your heart is relaxing in other parts of your body? Uh, and again, you know, this is, this is kind of a consequence of the fact that our blood vessels are flexible, okay? Particularly the, particularly the larger vessels. And so some of the bigger blood vessels in your body, because they're so flexible, when, the, when, when they fill with blood, they almost kind of act like a balloon. And so they kind of inflate, uh, inflate a little bit. Then when the heart is relaxing, then that balloon kind of deflates slowly, okay? And then as that balloon deflates slowly, it's gonna push kind of a near constant blood flow through your smaller arteries. Yeah, very similar to a pressure regular. Yes, very, very, um, uh, very apt. Yeah. Yep. And so the model that we're going to use to to uh, um, um, to explain this behavior is is a, is called a Windkessel. And so I believe that's 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 uh, um, you know that's that's kind of very similar to how pressure regulators work as well. Right. And so the last the, the last uh, behavior that we're going to talk about uh, has to do with the pressure wave again. Okay. Another result of that of that wave propagation phenomenon that we talked about um, earlier is the fact that the peak pressure in, in the vessels that are further away from the heart will kind of lag a little bit. And what I mean by that is that the peak pressure will occur a little bit after than, um, than those occurring earlier in the, uh, um, you know, in the, in the cardiovascular tree. 
And so if we go, if we go kind of compare that to here, okay, and we drew a, uh, a waveform further away from the heart, first, if you, the waveform would look something like this. And so the peak would be a little bit higher and it would occur a little bit afterwards. And so this purple here would be like, um, you know, further, further away from heart. Okay. And so that's, that's another consequence of that wave propagation phenomenon that we talked about there, talked about before. Okay. All right. Uh, any questions on, on this? Yep. Going back to number two, just make sure I fully understand it. Uh, Pressure increases as you go through there. And normally in a rigid body, as pressure increases, the velocity will be increased. But since it's not rigid, it's flexible, mm -hmm. we won't have an increase in, in uh, velocity. Correct. It decrease. So so the velocity might increase, but the but the flow, the flow will not. And so the um, because remember your, your blood vessels are getting a lot smaller. And so even the flow might be going down, you know, the peak velocity or or the actual you know speed of the fluid particles. Might be going up because the the vessels are just getting much smaller. What's the difference between the velocity and the flow? So flow is like the volume of the uh, the volume the rate of a of a volume of, of blood flow pushing through, oh, so, okay. and velocity is just the just the speed of the, of the blood. Okay. okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, how quickly do we see the flow wave flatten as we travel away from the heart? Like, is this you know that example you gave there? Is that only something we see like? Towards like our hands and feet or stuff, or do we see a pretty flat line as we start getting into like say like our legs or like our lower abdomen? Like how far away before it flattens? Yeah, it's a it's a pretty steady decrease, and so it's a pretty smooth curve. And so, um, kind of the extreme of this flow flattening would be um, when you get to the capillaries. And so, if you if you actually measure the the flow rate through the capillaries, it's it's basically constant. And so, the capillaries don't experience any volatility at all. And so you have this kind of variance from like um, something that's really highly falsifiable. And then as you get closer and closer to the capillaries, they kind of slowly get more and more flat. And then the capillaries, they just kind of completely. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Uh, any other questions on, uh, on this? Okay. So I'm going to stop it here just because uh, the next thing was, will kind of take a while to explain. And so on Tuesday, uh, we're going to do our SimVascular workshop. So make sure you download and install the software before then. Okay. And then on Thursday, we'll, we'll, we'll resume these lectures. Right? All right. So thank you everyone for tuning in today. Um, hope you guys enjoyed the rest of your weekend. And I will see you on Tuesday. Thanks, guys. Um, all right. Uh, all right. Uh, all right.